Welcome, welcome to a Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. It's beautiful out these windows. What are we gonna guess? It's blowing like, you know, 16, 17 out there. Everybody on the East Coast is saying, what, it's sunny in California? Yes, it is sunny in California. Wonderful to have everyone here. Let's see a little bit about future speakers. You wanna come by in June because we'll have the uh, Olympic member Luke Muller here on June the 12th talk to us about his incredible campaign to get to the U.S. Olympic sailing team in a fin. The last year the fins will be in the competition. He'll race against the only medalist from America last year and a member of our club, Caleb Payne. You will recall Caleb took a bronze in uh, Rio de Janeiro and the two of them are sparring partners and roommates and it's an incredible formula for getting great in sailboat racing. Um, come by as well in May, because you'll get to hear Bill Lynn, who's the managing director of the Harrishoff Museum and Classic Yacht Owners Association. He'll have lots of tales about classic yachts and Harrishoff yachts for us. Uh, Channing Robertson, also in May, will talk about uh, what nature can teach us about speed. There's a new field, um, uh, biomimetic design and he'll talk to us about why there are you know uh, uh, stitches on baseballs and dimples on golf balls and why those seemingly uh, uh, friction inducing drag inducing uh, features make them, them both faster um, Rick Paulus will be here the White House calligrapher for over uh, three decades. He'll be here to talk to us about From Sea to Shining White House, and he'll talk all about what a calligrapher does and his love of the sea and how we put the two together. Patrick Hunt, nautical um, surprises from Hannibal. He is the noted Stanford historian. He'll be talking about the beginnings of biological warfare um, almost a millennia ago, uh, or more than a millennia ago. Um, Want to come by and listen to um, Caleb Payne on March the 6th. Caleb Payne will be here to talk about his quest. He's the training partner I just mentioned of Luke Muller for uh, improving from a bronze. He has a bronze on the mantle, so he's going for the gold, as we all say. Uh, um, we'll be listening to Ben Wells next week on a history of a yachting history of the California Delta. And also in April, we'll have a talk by Roy Liggett, amateur archaeologist who has discovered whales in. Bakersfield. Yes, there once was a giant inland sea that went from Sacramento down to Bakersfield, and it was not opened at the Golden Gate, but who knows where? Monterey. Close, very close. Monterey was the entrance to this giant sea that stretched, and um, uh, so he'll be talking all about that, and he'll bring, uh, you know, pictures of uh, actual whale bone he found in Bakersfield. A little bit about our speaker today. It's always intriguing to listen how a person kind of got connected to their to their uh, field and their game. In this case, they come together both. Uh, he was born in Boston. I didn't say band. I said born in Boston and raised in Quincy. And he remembers at age eight, uh, sailing beetle, a beetle cat with his buddy in Cape Cod. And he didn't know at that time, but it would be 50 years before he could get back to such fun times sailing on Cape Cod. He went, um, he remembers listening to his mother tell him about, um, you know, Abigail Adams going up to the hill in Quincy and looking down at Bunker Hill at the battle and writing to her husband down in Philadelphia, you know, writing constitutional papers at the founding of our country. And then he went off to high school and in high school started getting interested in more and more about history as this echoed image inside of his head about, you know, Abigail Adams, you know, with her children, with her kind of looking down at this terrible battle that was going on. <clears throat> and he ended up studying history at Norwich College, which turns out to be a military school. And while he's there studying history, he starts getting real interested in military folks and the military lifestyle. He loved the discipline. He loved that they were straight away. He liked that it really didn't matter what your rank was, was how well you could get stuff done that counted as far as he was concerned. And uh, he found himself going into the Army. Korea was going at a full blast. And uh, he's one of these pretty bright guys who kind of advanced and advanced and advanced until, as a general, he became Army Chief of Staff. And if you know 
about Army Chief of Staff, you know that means you're sitting at the table. You're now part of the Joint Chiefs. You're at the absolute pinnacle of military power in our country. And he's got lots to say about that. But he still had these other images inside of his head about you know, the earlier part of his life and the nautical part of it. So when he retired in 95 at the age of 58, a full half century since he'd been a boy sailing on the Cape, he went back to the Cape in his McGregor 26, sailed around there and kind of noticed that when he was bringing his boat in and out of the harbor, he'd have to go under this bridge. But the bridge was getting closer and closer to the boat. Something was happening here. Now, pretty soon, he couldn't go in and out when he wanted to. He had to really pay attention to sea level rise. And the striped bass count, you know, as he got a little older, and traded in his uh, McGregor 26 for a sport fisher, he started catching striped bass. And at first, you could catch five per, s per fisherman. That was the limit. But pretty soon, the limit was less and less and less until it got to be one per fisherman. Something's going on here. Don't know what it is, but we got to start paying attention to this. Turns out that our speaker today actually um, chaired one of two major studies on the military consequences of um, climate change. And the significance of that could not be more important as he saw it empirically, not just academically. With all of that, please welcome our speaker today, General Sullivan a four-star general. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Known as Sully to old buddies. He's not the only Sully in the world. It's, they're all over the place. It's like Murphy and Murph. How many Murphs do we know? Okay, uh, folks, nice to be with you. I want to thank some people before I uh, go any further. First of all, Linares for uh, hosting me and plucking me up last night uh, after, what's that? Um, I, I should just comment that uh, to get here, I went all the way up to Timmins, Canada, in a uh, in a jet blue to get from Boston to here. If you know where Timmins is, it's north of Thunder Bay, and it is way north. Uh, we did that because there was a 250 knot headwind and violent turbulence across the continental United States. And he said, we're not going that way, hang on. And we got here. So anyway, I, I also want to uh, acknowledge someone who's here who's uh, played a big part in my life, and certainly her late husband did. Uh, Ann uh, Stone is uh, the widow of the Honorable Mike Stone, who was the Secretary of the Army when I was appointed the Chief of Staff of the Army. He's a World War II uh, veteran and uh, a great American, and, uh, and it's nice to see you. you need help along the way and anyway so look uh, I mean what's not to like about that anyway you can tell I live on the water down on Cape Cod and, uh, we don't have anything like this we got a canal but <laughs> all right uh, Look, I've spent my entire life in the Army. I'm going to give it to you straight. I didn't discover until I was a junior at Norwich University. And I graduated from Norwich University in 1959. And uh, by the way, Norwich is 200 years old this year. 
That makes us one of the oldest colleges in the United States. We're not as old as uh, Harvard or some of the more prestigious places in Cambridge. Uh, we were founded by a person who was the first superintendent of the military academy at West Point. He, uh, Alden Partridge, was a captain, and he felt that uh, citizen soldiers is what was needed in the United States of America, as opposed to soldier citizens. Now, that was a philosophical argument, uh, and we have both now, both ROTC and Norwich is the birthplace of ROTC, by the way. Anyway, I spent 36 years as an uh, active officer, culminating in my time as the chief of staff. And upon retirement, I, I after a couple of years out doing stuff, which wasn't very attractive to me, because I was, I liked being a soldier, I loved it. And the Army has a, a at a professional association that's about 60 years old. And the job came open and I competed and became the president and CEO of that outfit. Uh, publisher, publisher of magazines, publisher of articles, studies, and so forth and so on. And some of the largest uh, military um, shows expositions in the world, and uh, I did that for 18 years, and then took over a uh, project that has been on the books since 1814, got it, 1814, I didn't make a mistake. Congress of the United States told the uh, Army and the Navy to build a museum to house their artifacts. We just got around to it. It's being finished. It's a $200 million uh, undertaking, and we have just about raised all the money to do that. And it's enclosed now, and it should open within 20, uh, with next year. Uh, Okay, along the way, I was asked by a woman I know who was the uh, Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for the Environment. Uh, this was in the 90s. And in uh, the early part of this century, in, 20, uh, in uh, 2006, she called me up one day and said, hey, I want you to be on a study, and the study is the uh, is climate change. And I said, "Well, oh God, I don't know climate change." I couldn't even understand the newspaper articles that were written on it. And I said, "Sherry, I don't know anything about that. I'm a history major, and so forth and so on." And all I knew was it was complicated, and people were political issues were all over the place. Anyway, she talked me into it. Uh, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about two studies. There's the first one, the one that I was the chair of, and then there is the second one, which uh, looked at the first one, and I'll tell you what came out of it. But all right, let me, the first one is the national security and the threat of climate change. Now, you can get these. These are available. And the CNA is a think tank in Washington, and they will send you, this, this is not the whole study, it's not one page long. Uh, <laughs> This is just the cover sheet, and it was CNA's lowercase dot org. Uh, and if you send them a uh, you know, request, you'll get it. And then there's another one, 
And this one really tells you the state of play. I could stop talking on this if you understand what I'm going to say. National security and the accelerating risks of climate change. In other words, this one is 06 here. This one is 14, and it's worse. You got it? Worse. Now, remember, the subject is national security. It's not the data points. It's not how many Celsius. It's not all of that stuff. I'll tell you, you have all served every person on this study was either a three or a four star admiral or general. And most of us were just operators, ship drivers, pilots, armor guys, combat guys in both the Marines and the Army. And we listened to a lot of the experts. And what you get with experts, you get two experts arguing with each other about stuff we didn't understand. And by the way, the Congress, no wonder they didn't like it, because you couldn't understand it. You have one guy here, one guy over there at the same table, and they are arguing about arcane data. And you can't connect the dots. So we were told, look, you don't have to understand much to understand what's going on in places in Africa where drought causes conflict between Muslims and Christians. And once the fighting starts, things happen, and you get huge movements of people throughout the world. One of the, one of the uh, biggest things that did happen, uh, as we learned, was uh, Syria. Syria was actually caused by a drought in Russia. Uh, and the, the uh, wheat crop, a lot of which was exported to uh, Syria and other Arab countries. Uh, they, did, they wouldn't uh, export their wheat. And there was a drought in Syria, so the farmers started going into the cities to get work, and there was no work, and then the unrest started and the uh, problems started, which are still going on. And then uh, I don't have to tell you that that resulted in huge movements of Syrians into Europe. And if you're really into it, you see that Hungary, Poland, other countries in Europe, Italy, are reverting back to nationalism, and in some cases like Germany and Poland and Hungary, you start to see organizations that were big people. They were big on no, no impurities coming into our country. And in some cases, you see Nazi uh, extremist policies emerging. Now, they haven't taken over, but they're there. And it's starting to get uh, very uh, difficult for the German government and so forth and so on. And a lot of it is because of uh, climate change and people who are moving around up into Europe and so forth and so on. Now does, how does that in influence uh, the US uh, defense policies? without going into all of the details of why we're backing away from NATO, uh, or seem to be, uh, and other uh, alliances, this is all related to the same thing. 
climate change. So let me uh, tell you some of the uh, findings. This is uh, the forward to the study. The purpose of this study is to examine the national security consequences of climate change. But, uh, the specific questions addressed in the report are what conditions are climate changes uh, likely to produce around the world that would represent security threats to the United States of America? What are the ways in which these conditions may affect America's national security interests? Well, NATO is one of them. Uh, what action should the nation take to address the national security consequences of climate change? No, no data points know this. The trend lines were all wrong. The trend lines we saw, not the points, it's the trend lines. The salinity of that right out there. What, what about the, uh, the fish, where are they? I don't know about the Pacific Ocean. What I know personally is the Atlantic Ocean. Lobsters are moving out of Rhode Island. Now you say, well, that's a trivial piece of it. Yeah, it's a trivial piece of information, but it shows that things are moving. Uh, by the way, lobsters happen to be a money crop and a big crop, along with maple uh, syrup and so forth and so on. It's big in Vermont, billion dollars. And all of a sudden we find maple trees are not as productive because the winters are much less cold than they used to be, which affects the sap and so forth and so on. That's not a defense issue, it's an economic issue. So there's a lot going on here. Now, the findings were projected uh, climate change poses a serious threat to the America's national security. The coming decades include extreme weather events, drought, flooding, sea level rise, retreating glaciers, habitat shifts, and the increased spread of life-threatening diseases. Guess what's back, folks? Malaria. Malaria. Uh, Ebola. I don't know whether you know it or not, but the commanding general of the 101st Airborne Division and about the third of his division were deployed to Africa to beef up the World Health Organization on the last Ebola epidemic in Africa. That's one of 10, 10 army divisions. And we sent a third of it to Africa to help uh, with a, a Ebola uh, epidemic. And by the way, I know with interest uh, that people don't get vaccinations anymore in the United States. Now, if we have an emergency, I, I don't want to get into it. But look, if, if people come to the United States and have some of these diseases, and that's the case, that people aren't getting vaccinations and so forth, some of the diseases that are coming here could have real implications on our people. And uh, that's hidden in this here. Uh, and you have to have, your imagination can't, can't fail us. Uh, because uh, there's some things that we, there are people looking at it, but uh, all right, climate change acts as a threat multiplier. Now, a threat multiplier is something like the uh, the drought in Russia, and then the wheat doesn't get down into uh, Syria, and people riot in the streets, and the next thing you know, we got pressure being put on the people, and one thing leads to another, and you got guerrillas and so forth and so on. 
And uh, what you get is that uh, these projected climate change consequences uh, become serious. And the U.S. may get drawn frequently into these situations, and we are. We've been, we have troops in uh, Syria, some of whom unfortunately have been killed uh, helping others. That's what the uh, irony and the tragedy of a lot of this stuff is. Projected climate change will add to tensions even in stable regions of the world. Note what happened in Europe. It, it, you look at what happened in Europe. You have the Swedes. Do not let them in anymore. Nobody. Nobody. And it's uh, Germany, I'm sure you'll probably see a clamp down. Uh, Hungary, Italy, they're trying to keep them out. It's, it's hard, though. These are big. I, I read an article, this week's Time Magazine. Uh, Time Magazine, one of the analysts said, if you take all of the mo re moving refugees in the world and lump them together in one place, you'd have the fifth largest nation in the world. And a lot of it is climate change. No jobs, violence, nothing to eat, no water, drought, fire. I mean, right up there, fire, down there, fire, all caused by drought, mudslides, people. I don't know how many are still missing from the uh, from the fire up north, but uh, uh, that that was a tragedy. Now here's the recommendations of the first board: the national security consequences of uh, climate change should be fully integrated into the national security and national defense strategies. That did happen. In other words, what we did was we told the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Joint Chiefs that this should be entered into the national security and na national security and national defense, two different things. But they should be added to those strategies. And then the combatant commanders, like the Pacific Command, European Command, Africa Command, Africa Command in particular, should then add them to the little tasks, conditions, and standards so that they can help the countries that they are involved with in those places. And the U.S. should commit to a stronger national and international role to help stabilize climate change at levels that would avoid significant disruption to global, uh, global security and stability. That happened, but then, then we left uh, the Paris uh, Convention there on climate change. Uh, and by the way, our departure sort of stopped things. Uh, the U.S. Uh, should commit to c global partnerships, and we do have some, but not as many. Uh, that help develop nations build the capacity and resilience to better uh, manage climate processes. We find south of Somalia and Kenya and other countries uh, south of them that the, the Somalis are leaving uh, to move south because of the fish that are down in uh, Kenya and, and the other countries. Well, those countries don't have a Coast Guard. So all it takes is some little boats. So people have donated uh, rubber boats, Zodiacs, and so forth. So then you put a couple of machine guns in them, and you got a Coast Guard. So I mean, it's as simple as that. Uh, because the people who are poaching the fish 
Uh, they're, they're just out there in rowboats, uh, but they're trying to get, it's, it's all humans trying to survive. And uh, anyway, so that's what APRICOM tries to do. Uh, and uh, it, it's fairly successful, but you know, it's small stuff. The Department of Defense should conduct an assessment of the impact, Here, here's one that's really serious. The Department of Defense should conduct an assessment of the impact on U.S. military installations worldwide of rising sea levels, extreme weather events, and other projected climate change impacts over the next 30 to 40 years. Uh, probably the case in point, the big case in point is Portsmouth, Virginia, the Navy Yard for the uh, fleet. Um, I know it's probably a surprise to you, but all right, the, the piers there uh, are built to have the power under the pier that powers the ships when they're in the harbor so that they're not running their own generators and polluting and so forth and so on. These the aircraft carriers, submarines, cruisers and so forth and so on. Well, having, having these powerful electric cables underneath the pier, when the water is coming up down in the tidewater, that's not too good. So the Army Corps of Engineers is in the process of raising the piers so that the electric, these electric cables, which the ships hook into, keep their auxiliaries, uh, engines, uh, all that stuff going. Uh, and that is a multi-million dollar operation. If we lose a place like Portsmouth, there isn't another harbor on the East Coast that could take it. Now, th if you look here, you know, it could probably work here, but you don't want the Atlantic fleet all the way over here. Because the Chinese own both ends of the Panama Canal. I guess everybody knows that, right? Great move. Great move. You tell me. Uh, okay, so. All right, so that, that study goes out. And so I'm sitting in a, three of us, Joe Lopez, Admiral Joe Lopez, myself, and another Army general gave a little talk on this, sort of like this. And at the end of the night, at the end of, it was at the Brookings, I think Brookings, or uh, maybe uh, it was, uh, Council on Foreign Relations, one of them. And this gent got up in a nicely dressed, older, and he turned to the audience and he said, I never thought I would see in my lifetime three gents like this saying what they just said. They are the most unlikely people to be talking about the environment and this subject. And you ought to pay attention to him. He was the retired president of the World Wildlife crowd. And he said, pay attention to what these guys are saying. All right, so things go along, and uh, the uh, national intelligence people, in fact, began to study. All right, we got, Mike, you want me to talk faster? Okay, I told you what the next one was, now, 
just climate change and military installations, sea level rise, storm surge, flooding, leading to infrastructure damage, loss of utilities, loss of operational capacity. These are the things we're worried about. Expanded wildfire threat to ranges. These are military ranges where you shoot. And by the way, the grass catches fire. And the next thing you know, you got a forest fire. Now, I don't think any of that stuff's happening here because there's no trees down in uh, uh, the world famous National Training Center down in Barstow, California. There's a garden spot. Uh, thawing and permafrost causing damage to foundations and loss of Arctic sea. You, by the way, you can take a sailboat, a wooden sailboat, from Maine to Alaska, across, all the way across the Northwest Passage. Whoosh. Remember Lewis and Clark? They were looking for it. Well, I know where it is. You got it. And we have two, two icebreakers. And one of them is ancient. And the Russians are building them with nuclear power in them. And the Chinese, too. And there is tons of gas and petroleum up there. What are we going to do? And what is our role? in the defense of Alaska, which is vulnerable to any number of things. All right, climate change and new missions. Uh, the meeting uh, melting of Arctic ice caps leading to increased trade and requirements for naval activity in the Arctic. Uh, increased storm frequency and strength. Some of these storms take your breath away. I don't know what was going on last night. But I can tell you, I have never taken that kind of a detour uh, to get across the country. That, that burned up a lot of fuel to do that. And uh, anyway, OK, climate change and global instability. Drought and other extreme weather events leading to food and water shortages. The, the lake glaciers you have to watch are the ones in the stands in Russia, the ones in the Himalayas, the ones up in China that feed the Mekong River, and the rivers that run down through Indochina. If they melt and there's no water coming down, that's a lot of people. Those are in some of the most uh, populated parts of this planet. And it's not looking good. Uh, existential threats to island nations. Kwajalein, where we have our range, it's the end of the range uh, for missiles testing and so forth and so on. That's going underwater. It's going underwater. And we're going to lose them. And there's billions, billions involved in that kind of stuff. And where do we, how do we replace it? So anyway, all right, look. People look for, I'm gonna, my last thing I'm going to say is this. Everybody wants 100% certainty that we know what we're talking about. It's apparent to me after spending my whole life as a soldier, that the quest for 100% certainty is doomed. You will never have 100% certainty on risk. And you have to be willing and able to make a decision based on what you have. If you're a soldier, sailor, airman, marine, you, you see what you got, and you make your decision, and you move out. And if it isn't quite as you thought it was, then you improvise. And that's what these gentlemen did, is they gave you a look 
at their best estimate of what's going on and what might go on. I think it's worth taking time to look at this rather than just saying these, you know, this is a hoax. Folks, believe me, it's not a hoax. Nobody could make this up. Nobody could make it up. And uh, now I, I'm ready to take your questions if you want them, if you want to give them to me. Uh, I've got a gent who's going to ask me hard questions. <laughs> Bring your mic. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. Yes. This is the best room I ever gave a speech in. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Welcome again to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Our guest today is General Gordon Sullivan, retired four-star general, uh, Army Chief of Staff, and as such, a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And a soldier, as he'd said to me a couple times during lunch. First and foremost, a soldier. So, um, General Sullivan, um, would you say the cost of avoiding global warming and sea level uh, rise is cheaper than the cost of adjusting our national security posture after such global warming and sea level rise? Is the cost of avoiding it cheaper than the cost of adjusting our world after such? Well, yeah, we Keep close have, to the mic. Yeah. We can't, uh, we can't solve everybody's problem. But, I mean, if you look at uh, Manhattan, for instance, if you look at what happened during hur Hurricane Irene, all of the subways, all, whatever they call them, they call them subways in Boston, the, uh, the MTA, I, I don't know what they call them. Subways. Subways. They, they flooded. They flooded, and everybody, w Manhattan was shut. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg was on it, and he, he was working with the uh, uh, Corps of Engineers to see what could be done around uh, Manhattan. And I happen to know that there's a big Dutch company going around on the East Coast, and they're probably out here, too, looking at uh, what could be done on some of this infrastructure around places like this and elsewhere. Uh, but that's not, we were talking about what do you do in places like Somalia and uh, other places in the Middle East and so forth. But it's not spending a lot of money, it's helping them get, to get things put together. So that's money worth. We're there anyway. And it's, uh, I think it's, yeah, I think it's helpful. So uh, I'm going to keep asking questions, but if you have one, please uh, raise your hand and Jim will bring around the mic. Uh, so General, do you think the Russians are deliberately taking advantage of climate change where they see it to weaponize immigrants to cause uh, disruption in uh, governments around the world where they can do so? Are they deliberately weaponizing immigrants flowing out of Syria into uh, Eastern and Western Europe to deliberately disrupt those governments? I, d I don't know. I, d I don't. I can't. I can't. S I don't have any evidence. I have a clearance, but uh, I haven't uh, looked at that. It wouldn't surprise me. I know in Ukraine, what we saw in Ukraine was a, a Russian army, or at least a part of the old Red Army, which Putin and his generals worked on while we were involved, and still are, in Afghanistan and, uh, and uh, Iraq. Uh, so there was some infiltration there and so forth. And that's normal. And we saw it in Georgia, too. 
and uh, so yeah it's going on but I don't know how much I, d I don't have any way of knowing but uh. Pam you have a question yes General Sullivan um, I'd like to know if you thought of all of us as citizen soldiers what would you like us to do based on what you know I'd like you to get the get a copy of the, both of these studies and look at them. These are written in language every one of you can handle. It's not so esoteric or so, you know, scientific. It's just common sense. And try and build awareness that look this is going on and it's not a joke and uh, when you look at places on the east coast and the west coasts and the gulf I mean there's going to be tons of uh, destruction coming in, in places you know that we know with people are living and you can see it I can see it in Falmouth you, you know people who are building up next to the water yeah like right here they're building that they're putting their houses up on stilts the cost so, of adjusting after climate change yeah. is, is measurable in trillions right, right. yes sir uh, general thank you for giving this talk first of all and uh, uh, and Richard and Katie helping to bring you out here. Uh, my question is, do you think that we're going to see more of a political use of, let's say, closing the spigot of wheat, wheat from, let's say, Russia to Syria, uh, it can be other countries, but using that economic shutoff valve to change politics, to change uh, possible warfare? I don't think there's any. Yeah, I understand the question, but I don't think there's any there's any indication that they shut it off to cause the problem. In other words, I think it happened, and then they had to feed. They had trouble feeding the Russian people. So, yeah, it, it was. I don't believe it was some nefarious. You know, plot on that. It could be, uh, and I think in in the case of uh, China, we see some indication that they're they're turning the screws on on uh, maybe the Philippines over the Spratleys. You know, the oil out there, uh, oil and gas and so forth. So it wouldn't be the first time in history that that's been done. But I don't have any evidence that uh, the Russians did. Now, I know they did some stuff in Ukraine, but uh, not that. <coughs> so General, uh, Moscow is 600 feet above sea level and 800 miles from the shoreline. Their northern Urals are permafrost-covered mineral deposits that are currently unaffordable. They can't get down to the mineral. If they could, if, if, if Iowa gets as hot as currently Arizona is, the northern Urals could be the largest east-west swath of farmland on Earth. Do you think that Russia benefits from global warming? Well, sure. I mean, if that's, uh, if you can farm throughout uh, Siberia. Their northern shoreline has been inaccessible for deep water craft, but they're doing lots of exploration up there. If they can warm that and get deep water ports, they could have the shortest sea routes to anywhere in the world. They don't have to go around, they go straight down. Oh yeah, if you, did in the second study, there's a map that shows how, how uh, never mind, we don't have the time, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's, uh, 
That's true. There's a lot of things that are true. What this, what these reports do, is they cause this kind of discussion to take place, so that somebody like you, as a mariner, understands the globe, and look, if it's just as easy. It was just as easy for me to deploy the airborne troops up in Alaska from here, from Alaska to Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. Over the it's top. It's shorter. Over yeah. the top. Right. Great circle route. So would send the uh, C-17s for them to jump out of up to Anchorage to pick them up. And isn't it the case that they're doing tremendous engineering in the North Pole right now with the big s icebreakers that they have, construction like crazy, it military uh, activity? It is. It is. Most people don't know it. It's not classified. I mean, I, there is a glossy book that I've seen that has uh, icebreakers of the world, and it's amazing. I don't even. Th I think the U.S. has got has one. That's really an icebreaker. I mean, pay now, pay later. Pay now, pay later. Do we want to see all of these characters up there, off our coast? When all of a sudden, Alaska, the North Shore of Alaska, becomes. Hey. It's America. The last time we were attacked up there was the Aleutians during World War II, and most people hardly know about that. Any other question? Yes, yes. John Bechtel. Is, um, is Congress taking this as, as, as seriously as, a, as you are? <laughs> I, I don't, no. No, I don't think so. There are some, there are some who do. I mean, some, some say it's a hoax. Look, the aquifers are drying up. The same aquifers that feed Kansas feed Oklahoma. If those aquifers f dry up, you got a lot of wheat that comes from there. You know, I mean, what they want is water. Now, if you want to talk about water, then probably they're concerned. But you can't, you have to be careful how you talk about it. it it's not climate change, it's some, uh, something else. It's a lack of water. So uh, are you familiar with a proposal uh, currently under consideration in California to bypass San Francisco Bay with a 40-foot diameter tunnel above Sacramento to take water to Southern California? There are those of us who think, rather than use a 13th century solution, a tunnel or an aqueduct, it might be wiser to invest that money in solar-based desalinization technology and later sell that same technology to the Middle East and the rest of the world that needs water. Well, what what's Israel doing? I mean, Israel, Saudi Arabia, they're all uh, desalinating water. I mean, I, I know that we have an aversion to, apparently, to uh, nuclear power, but we have submarines that people are are sleeping in for <laughs> six months, and they're right next to the reactor. And you know, you tell me, why can't we do it with little nukes? I mean, we had we had them. The U.S. Army had a project where we were powering the uh, Panama Canal with one mounted on a boat or on a ship with the reactor in case the power was cut. And in 73, when we were running out of money because of Vietnam, they killed the program. 
and most, most, I think all of them have been capped now. There may be one, but uh, maybe, I don't know for sure. But look, we have to become, we have to become more aware of our own vulnerabilities. If you, if we can p ship petroleum all the way from the northern uh, part of Alaska down to wherever, to the ships, you know, why can't we do it with water? That's uh, that we suck out of the uh, Gulf of Mexico. It's it's uh, water weight is less than uh, petroleum. Going back to something, I, there must be a, somebody in the room who knows the the real answer, for how much less? But it's it has to be less. Uh, less of a push or pull. You mentioned earlier um, citizen uh, soldiers. Um, early in your career, in January 61, Eisenhower said, beware of the military industrial complex. Could you talk a little bit about um, people who go f directly from the services to business and then back again? What do you think about that? Should there be tighter guidance on people returning from industry back into service? Well, I think we're, we're overreacted a little bit to it. Uh, you know, you get people who abuse it. Uh, there are ways of, uh, there are ways of putting sanctions against people. And there are some who gain experience by going into business for, uh, you know, a couple of years, five years, then they come back into the Pentagon. And uh, as long as they're not in a direct procurement role, if they're in, if they're in the leadership uh, where they don't vote, where they're not voting on general dynamics or uh, uh, some other company building uh, combat vehicles, Lockheed, or whatever, they're not making that decision, then I don't see anything wrong with it. But, uh, but the ones I think they're worried about are the ones, the ones Congress is worried about are the people at the top in the procurement business, especially in DOD. Someone who might go from Boeing to the Department of Defense, you're saying? Yeah. I think that's a pregnant subject. So uh, it's it's always bad. Who who is our greatest geopolitical um, worrisome or call it enemy nationally? Uh, why not worry about long? Uh, is it Russia? Long term? Yeah, it's Russia. I mean, there it's. I think it's an open question how how penetrated we are by Russia already. There's a pregnant subject. So, well, sure. I mean, if everybody says, well, the, they influenced the last election, and now they. I mean, that's talked about all the time, and I'm not sure that we're at the bottom of it yet, so. Would it be cheaper for them to break up our alliances um, than to be, uh, match us militarily with current conventional I don't want to answer that question. Because I'd, I, I, I'd prefer not to answer it. Because there are other things going on that uh, I don't understand. This has been an incredibly fascinating hour. I uh, want to thank you, General uh, Gordon Sullivan, four-star retired general and uh, Army Chief of Staff for being with the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us, sir. And with that, with that the luncheon's adjourned.
Good going, General.